beyond the wardrobe, childlike wonder in relation to Christian faith. It is a sweltering summer day, the kind of day that dries and burns your skin the moment you step outside. My brothers and I sit talking outside on the porch, equipped with cold drinks, wishing for nothing more than a pool and an extra bottle of sunscreen. Suddenly, one of my nieces bursts out from behind a bush and runs over to me, the two younger ones tagging behind. Undaunted by the weather, she tugs on my hand excitedly, with the others quickly following suit. Come help, Sarah, come help, she squeals as she points back towards the bush. There's lions in the garden. Lions, shriek the other two. The eldest once again looks up at me, slightly more serious. You have to help us beat them, she says confidentially. In the age we live in, maturity and being an adult is flaunted as glorious and desirable. Growing up and all the advantages that come with it are pushed in the media as fun and are encouraged even in the youngest children. Drinking, sex, and drugs are pushed until children even as young as 12 years old are losing their innocence and wonder in exchange for the real world. At the fault of this secular culture, children are told that party life is desirable and that their imagination is foolish. This kind of philosophy truly began its culmination in the Age of Enlightenment, which drew focus off of God and onto the measure of man, giving him the authority of reason in every aspect of life. According to William Bristow, a professor of philosophy whose studies focus on the ideologies of Immanuel Kant, the main premise of the Enlightenment was, quote, the process of undertaking to think for oneself, to employ and rely on one's own intellectual capacities in determining what to believe and how to act. When this change of focus occurred, man began to place more value on himself and what he wanted. Eventually, it evolved into the culture we observe today. This idea of life has penetrated Christian ideals and worked itself into our perceptions of reality. As a result of Christians losing their sense of childlike wonder, many fall away from their faith for the temptations of this world and many of us lose the wonder we once had as believers when we experience the troubles of the world. Childlike faith is necessary to maintain true Christian faith. Merriam-Webster defines childlike as, quote, resembling, suggesting, or appropriate to a child or childhood, especially marked by innocence, trust, and ingenuousness. It defines faith as something that is believed especially with strong conviction. Therefore, the term childlike faith should be defined as something believed with a strong conviction marked by innocence, trust, and ingenuousness. There are three basic reasons that childlike wonder relates to Christian faith. First, childlike faith opens our eyes to the true meaning and purpose of Christian faith. Second, lack of childlike faith strips us of our ability to understand the Christian faith. And third, this misunderstanding leads to an ultimate rejection of faith. Childlike faith and wonder open our eyes to the true meaning and purpose of Christian faith. The wonder that accompanies the simple faith of a child allows children to accept the seemingly impossible while still holding to the obvious laws of nature. As G.K. Chesterton says, according to fairy tales, quote, you cannot imagine two and one not making three but you can easily imagine trees not growing fruit. You can imagine them growing candlesticks or tigers hanging on by the tail." Unquote. When we believe as a child does, we are able to believe the miracles of the Bible and the laws of logic as equally factual. This is because, as a child, we hold infinite awe and wonder of the world, not simply facts and what we believe to be knowledge. When we have this childlike faith, the awe and wonder stretches to all points of our lives, enabling us to understand the Christian faith more and more. We are able to regard the world as God made it, living, breathing, and speaking to us all. As N.D. Wilson says, God is continually speaking to us through his creation, and it takes a sense of wonder to hear him. God is always speaking, but in a different way from how we view speech. He speaks in actions and objects and sounds, quote, tree, 
God says, and there is one. But he doesn't say the word tree. He says the tree itself. He needs no shortcut. He's not merely calling it into existence, though his voice creates. His voice is its existence." Unquote. How could we, with our facts and scientific methods and equations alone, possibly be able to hear God in speaking in so many forms without the imagination he has given to us from the time we were born? He equips us with the ability to see the world as it truly is. Our youthful awe of such a creation allows us to dream so much farther than a mathematical table. It allows us to believe in a God who speaks in matter. Adversely, not only does childlike faith open our eyes to true Christianity, but the lack of childlike faith strips us of our ability to understand the Christian faith. Just as the faith of a child makes it possible to believe in miracles, the lack of childlike faith creates a skepticism about anything one might think cannot be proved by experimentation. It produces a lack of imagination and, therefore, a lack of understanding of the wonder of Christian faith. Those who embrace the mature theology lack imagination for anything fantastical. Polly unknowingly proves this in C.S. Lewis's The Magician's Nephew, when Diggory postulates that there might be criminals in an abandoned house by saying, quote, Daddy thought it must be the drains. Pooh, Diggory, Diggory childishly and correctly replies. Grown-ups are always thinking of uninteresting explanations. Adopting a materialistic worldview leads us to expect something to always occur simply because it has consistently before. Unlike this view, a childlike faith and worldview knows that though most wardrobes usually hold clothes, that does not mean that there is not a world in some other wardrobe. They know that though the dead do not usually rise, that does not mean they cannot. When this worldview is presented to us, we are able to carry it to its logical outworking. If a materialistic worldview leads us to expect something to occur simply because it always has, we are assuming that things must always happen in the way we observe. If we assume this, we are clearly assuming it on the fact that our foreknowledge and our present knowledge are the only things that can prove truth. Once we reach this conclusion, we have removed all room for faith from the argument. Without faith, we cannot have Christianity, as it is the basis for our religion. Only with childlike faith are we able to open our eyes to the possibilities of the world beyond observable repetition. Without it, we are forced to either not think hard on our faith, but believe blindly, or forsake it entirely. Not only does a lack of childlike faith strip away our ability to understand Christianity, but such a misunderstanding of Christianity leads to a rejection of our faith. A large component of childlike faith is the innocence that accompanies it. A popular phrase among Christians is, in the world, but not of the world. Childlike faith and wonder give us this protection, the ability to remain in the world and observe its sin while still retaining innocence, and, if not always innocence, then most certainly repentance. Without this tool that guards us and enables Christian understanding, what is to stop us from becoming completely immersed in a secular culture? What is to stop the cynicism that almost always accompanies such a secular age? Sadly, the loss of such a tool leads to a rejection of faith. As stated in the previous argument, a lack of childlike faith can lead to a materialistic worldview. In other words, if it cannot be proved, then it does not exist. This is another path that leads to the rejection of Christian faith, and something must be done to guard it. Children do not need help to imagine world behind wardrobes, but adults do. If a Christian does not strive to keep his faith from adopting a materialistic worldview, he will not comprehend basic tenets of Christian faith, and therefore cannot plausibly believe in it. If one does not understand something, and does not have any reason to believe in it, then he will logically conclude that it is not true. Without
without childlike faith, Christians slowly lose their reasons to believe in God, Christ, and the Incarnation. Now, this does not mean that Christianity is an uninformed faith. There are many logical ways to conclude Christianity. But it is the truth of love, not found in any other religion, yet so easily found in a child, that truly defines Christian religion. Without this willingness to love and cherish, there is no way for Christianity to flourish. My three arguments so far are that childlike faith opens our eyes to the true meaning of Christianity. Lack of it strips us of our ability to understand our faith, and this leads to an ultimate rejection of it. But some may not agree with these arguments. Some may say that we are called to grow to adult, into adulthood in Christ. They may cite the verse in which Paul rebukes the Christian church, saying that they were still children in Christ, declaring, quote, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready, unquote. How are we to be childlike in faith when Paul chastises us for being Christian, children? Yes, we are called to grow and mature in Christ. However, growing in Christ and childlike faith different as they may seem, are not contradictory. In fact, childlike faith is necessary to grow in Christ. Christian growth is not the same as worldly growth. Christianity is furthered and enriched by this child's faith and crippled by the world's idea of maturity. Christ even exhorts us to be like children, saying, quote, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Unquote. Such a faith allows us to believe and accept the Bible's extraordinary accounts, which is most certainly a growth in Christ. Some would say that my thesis is not even necessary, because our culture has already embodied the opposite of maturity, embracing youth and juvenility. One can't help but notice that the youth are disrespecting adults and constantly wanting to live their own life unhampered by age. The culture of today is nothing but juvenile. However, juvenility is not the subject of my arguments. Childlike faith is marked by innocence, love, and trust. Juvenility is not the same. The culture of today pushes juvenile qualities by urging children to rebel against their families, to do what they are told not to do, and to expect everything to be handed to them like they deserve it. Childlike faith is humble and unassuming. The whole basis of today's culture is to rebel against authority and become old enough to do what you want. The whole basis of childlike faith is to hold existence in awe, to view everything as a gift. Childlike faith does not mean that you must be juvenile. In a way, it is harder to become like a child than to be an adult. It requires faith which, according to Hebrews 1.11, is, quote, being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. As stated before, maintaining faith is harder as we become older, while rebelling against authority is always easy. It takes work, patience, and trust. None of these qualities require, are required by the idea of juvenile today. In fact, it is the complete opposite. Patience is one thing that is certainly not encouraged, since we live in a society where everything is at our fingertips at the touch of a keyboard. Neither is hard work. It is not even prized for its value anymore, but simply for its use. Work hard so you can go to a good college and get a good job. The entire premise is completely self-serving. Though this culture may be juvenile, it most definitely does not have the tenets of childlike faith. It is clear that none of these arguments, when truly examined, refute or weaken my arguments and thesis as a whole. My niece waits on, looking expectantly, becoming slightly impatient. I give a sigh of contentment and follow after them. After all, who am I to argue with lions in the garden? No matter what kind of lions they are, my nieces know without a doubt what is to be done with lions. They are to be defeated. As any child knows, there will always be lions, and one must believe in them to be able to defeat them.